So Seamus, I assume you know that the Olympics are going on these days. I do know that. I thought I was going to watch them, and I have not watched a single moment of Olympic anything. I don't know who has won anything or what the big stories are, but I am aware that, that the Olympics are happening. We have some friends from the Philippines, and so I got a link to a, the video of the first Philippines gold medalist in the history of the Olympics, which is pretty fun. Really? The Philippines have never had a gold medal before? Apparently not till till just a few days ago. The uh, women's heavyweight lifting, I think, competition. Well, congrats to them. Have you had a chance to play the Google Splash Page Olympic-esque game? I didn't even realize that's what... I've seen ads for it. Like, I've been to Google and seen that image, and it didn't occur to me that that had to do with the Olympics. It was oh, just yeah. like, oh, uh, yeah. It's just like, oh, Google's excited about something. Whatever. Whatever you're excited about this week, Google. Just, <laughs> you know, tell me what this compiler error means. and Get out of my way. You're so inured to their advertisements. It doesn't phase you at all. Exactly. I wouldn't have engaged with it either, except that my kids started playing it. They're like, oh, this is a really fun game. You should play this, Dad. And I'm like, the Google thing? But it's surprisingly deep. I was I was impressed. Oh, my. Okay, now, now I have to check it out. The, uh, the thing that I enjoyed most was being able to, in the second try, beat the, uh, the rhythm game, which my kids have no experience with rhythm games at all. And so they were just like, this is impossible. Dad, have you seen this impossible game in the, you know, the Google game? And uh, all their, all their, their uh, competitions in the game, I think there are eight, are little mini games. And so there's a, a rhythm game one, right. and there's a, one that's like Pong, and there's one that's uh, like a, you know, navigation, like those scrolling navigation games. Anyway, there's a, there's a bunch of, you know, different little mini games. And, and they did a good job with them, but because I've played DDR and I've done some rhythm games in my past, I was like, oh, okay, I got this, you know, like the rhythm game thing. And they were just like, dad, how did you do that? That's incredible. I was like, yes, that feels good. <laughs> You're right. Plus you play piano. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate rhythm game right there. Uh, yeah. Okay. I can see it. Yeah. I mean, not only do you have to hit the buttons at the right time, but there are a lot more buttons. I mean, that's so hard mode buttons. right there. Coincidentally, this has nothing to do with computer games, but we did get our piano very recently. We Every time we move, we have to get a new piano because we're not going to take that thing with us. But uh, And so I've been like tuning it all today. And it's just, ugh, tuning pianos is the worst. Well, I don't know why they have so many buttons. It's it's overkill, honestly. They should get rid of at least half of them. Like the black ones, like who uses those? Yeah, exactly. Although... Neat trick. If you want to just play something and have it sound good, play only the black keys. Oh. Oh, right, because that would be that would be a key. Yeah. It's a yeah, it's a pentatonic scale. Right. Anyway, so that was a Google Olympics video game thing. It was fun. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, there's a link. In, I don't know if you'll put it in the show notes, but this, that link is to my save game. However far I got in my first you know playthrough or whatever. So this week we're going to do a bunch of mailbag questions. I don't know how many we're going to do. There were a lot. Um, we've got, looks like six or seven right now. And I cut a few. There, there were several that were, you know, if, if we had, uh, if we were hurting for them, we could have filled the show with the ones I threw away. Um, but here I'm going to answer two questions that these were both mailbag questions, but people, different people emailed and asked what happened to Bob Case, Mr. B-Tongue. And the answer is, I don't know. He just, I know he uh, had his series Achilles and the Grognard on my site. And everybody, mm -hmm. of course, loved it. And, you know, I mean, it's Bob Case's writing. So everybody was, like, really enjoying it. He stepped away at some point, I think before the pandemic, and just hasn't come back. So that's all I know. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, he, you know, the door is always open for him. He can come back whenever he wants. Um, so I don't know what went on with him personally or why he left. To my knowledge, he didn't leave because he doesn't like my stupid, stupid, dumb face and not want to put up with me anymore. <laughs> or your audience, I guess. Right. All right, so that's okay. all I know. I'm sorry, I can't report. I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you more. 
any more juicy details. Right. Yeah, I I kind of wondered too, but creative people do tend to kind of drift in and out of projects, and uh, yep. Bob's channel has not updated in even longer than he has been contributing to your site. So, I kind of felt guilty when he was publishing when he was publishing on my site because I thought, you know, he's got creative things to say, and he probably has a fixed number of things to say, and he was getting them. My worry was that he was getting those things out on my blog rather than turning them into videos, which mm. was good for me, but bad for all the people that would have enjoyed a video more. The larger video, the larger audience that would have been there for a video. Yeah. Although you could always turn like a series of posts into a video at some point. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to take an existing piece and transform it for another medium than it is to just come up with new material entirely right. out of whole cloth right you can sort of use that as a starting point for a script hmm well i'm sorry to hear he's not coming back anytime soon as far as we know yep that's all i know i'm sorry can't tell you more well speaking of leaving i uh this week i've been playing before we leave a bit it's a city builder it, it reminds me a lot of dyson sphere project in many ways it's multi-planetary it's got resource management um the the main difference is that in Dyson Sphere Project, like in Factorio, you have single product belts, like single directional transmission things that you're trying to manage and uh, conveyor belts in both games. But in Before We Leave and in most city builder games, you have roads that people go on and they can go both directions. And uh, it's basically just like a, a network of transportation as opposed to like unidirectional uh, channels or links that you connect things up with. Okay. And uh, I, I've been really enjoying the seeing the differences between the two games and how they handle stuff. In in Dyson Sphere Project, I never ran out of space. There was always so much space that was just like, well, just you know, build up or build out or whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, and before we leave, they they've got a very nicely balanced amount of space. So you're building something, you're like, okay, this is a big island, I'll have plenty of room, but then you've got the farms, and you've got the, the houses and all the roads everywhere, and a road takes up an entire block. So that it's not trivial to just place some roads somewhere. You're using up spaces that you could be using for something else. And pretty soon you filled the whole island, and now you've got to demolish some stuff so you can make a port so that you can go make a ship to go to another island, and then you've got to demolish some more stuff to make a trading post. And it's like, oh man, this is... It never feels like you're super cramped, but it's always like, oh, I have to think about this decision because if I put it in the wrong place, I'm going to ham hamstring myself later. Right. It looks real pretty. I'm, I'm watching the trailer now. My goodness, it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's it's pretty nice. I love playing on the surface of a sphere. Mm -hmm. You know, for years, games would just, you know, you'd play on that rectangular map that we always had, you know civilization is played on a rectangular map you know they're just tiles and i like this new trend where newer games are like yeah we'll just take that and put it on the surface of a sphere and yeah. that is just so cool yeah it's so good yeah it's it's fun and i like how it does um it has pollution which normally i don't i don't like dealing with like real world pollution kind of stuff but this is very abstracted and like basically any production building produces pollution which is basically like uh, it makes your your guys unhappy and, and then they don't work as fast so it's not like it's going to kill anybody it's just that it makes you less efficient and so then you can think about okay well i want to put the main road away from the pollution so your guys aren't walking through it all the time and it, it's another layer of uh of interesting drawbacks and side effects and things Whereas in Dyson Sphere Project and in uh, Satisfactory, I don't know if they do in Factorio, um, but those games deal with side effects by having multiple outputs. So you produce one of this thing, but then you also have to deal with the output of this one other thing. And what are you going to do with that? Are you going to... In Satisfactory, you can just throw it in a, in a recycler, right? And just toss it. But in Dyson Sphere Project, you can't. There's no product sync. And so you've got to do something with it, you stockpile it or burn it up or something. What are you going to do with this byproduct? 
And uh, that's an interesting challenge, but it can be kind of annoying after a while. It's like, well, why can't I just throw this yeah. thing on the ground? Sort Whereas, of over uh, in before shadows. We leave, it sort of overshadows the core game after a while. It just becomes dealing with pollution. The game. It, yeah, well, it didn't get too bad in in uh, Dyson Sphere Project. The, the main thing, the main side effect product that I was having trouble dealing with was hydrogen. Uh, because it's produced by when you're producing graphene, which you need for something else, you produce this hydrogen and you can't burn it fast enough. You basically can't burn it off fast enough because burning it produces more energy than you need to do the whole process. And so you've got all this extra energy and then it slows down and then it slows down production because now it's backing up and then you eventually stop producing it and then you don't have any of the resource anymore. So you got to go and unjam the pipes all the time. Uh, so that's a, that's an annoying thing. But in Before We Leave, you don't have that problem. You just have this generic pollution thing that gets emitted, and uh, and then you can deal with it or not deal with it, and it just makes you less efficient. It's like, well, okay, that's fine. It's, it's nice to have that it's, option to not worry about it. It's another it's another thing to balance with all the other aspects of the game. It's not a new challenge that supersedes everything that came before. Yeah, yeah. Which is what i felt like i i feel like a lot of games that try and deal with pollution want to go that way with it it's like oh you thought you were playing a management game but now you're playing global pollution the game and it's like oh so now i'm playing this really frustrating no win one dimensional game where i was yeah like in city skylines it. where like yeah as soon as you start doing sewage stuff it's like oh well now this is going to be sitting around forever and there's no way tools to deal with it and that's another right. great thing before we leave there's like tools in the game to deal with pollution it's like you can build this building and these guys will clean it up or you can use alternate methods and it's like it's well integrated oh yeah it's city skylines if you dump sewage in the ocean it just stays there for decades oh yeah, not a fan. And garbage too, right? Like you have to build a garbage right. dump and then you're constantly dealing with trash piling up and it's just like, I don't want it. I don't want, I want to make a cool city. I don't want to have to deal with the garbage. This isn't garbage truck simulator. Right. The sewage one frustrates me because um, when you start the game, you can't, there are no sewage treatment plants and there are no septic tanks. Right, you have to just dump raw sewage into a body of water. And I'm like, okay, for one thing, this game is not set in the 1800s. This is ridiculous. Right, well, and even they had septic pits. Right, right. So this is ridiculous. But then when you do that, you've just got to, you know, you've got to dump sewage somewhere until you get your town big enough to unlock your first sewage treatment. And in the time it takes to do that, You'll dump sewage in the coast. You'll just have to. You, okay, you're going to dump it off the coast. And then, you know, it'll sort of, the tides will bring it in and it'll just sit there forever. This brown seawater. I, I can't tell you how, like, 40 years this sewage doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> we stopped <laughs> 40 years ago and it's still there. Come on. And it frustrates me because they they went to the trouble of simulating part of it and then they just sort of like skipped simulating the rest of this and so it's this terrible system that makes no sense yeah it is both unfun another way and nonsensical right right like why did you put this in there no one's enjoying it and it doesn't make any sense it's not simulating anything real Ugh. Uh, another way, it, which I like before we leave better than Dyson Sphere Project, just because the two kind of beg a comparison. Uh, you know, they're both planet hopping, building factory kind of games. Uh, is in Dyson Sphere Project, you've got tools for viewing the stats on your your production and stuff. But all you have is how much you're producing and how much you're consuming. And it's got a, a, you know, a running graph of that. But you can't see your stockpiles. You don't know, like... Am I producing this much and consuming this much because I'm completely out and this is, and I could be consuming more or oh, am right. I producing and consuming this much because I've totally backed up and I can't produce any more because I need to consume more. Like there's no way to tell from looking at it, which one of those two scenarios, which are very different situations you're in. Right. Right. And, and, uh, before we leave does have that. Yeah, Before We Leave has great tools, not only for like 
your stockpiles, how much you're producing, how much you're consuming, but how much could you be producing if everything was running at 100% and how much could you be consuming oh, nice. if everything was running at 100%. And so it's like, oh, this is fantastic. I, I love it. I love it. It's, it's ace. Yeah, before we leave is now on my wish list. This looks super groovy. All right. Uh, what do you say we do some mailbag questions? Yes. All right. Hi. So I was reading your blog entries about story collapse and trust in the storyteller. You described the logical process of losing trust until it would lead to inevitable story collapse. And I remembered that I actually had the opposite experience. After 10 years of not watching anime, I decided to watch one series for whatever reason. I was prepared to just watch and forget it as a dumb action schlock that it probably is. And yet initial episodes didn't really wow me. But during the season, I started to notice quite a masterful, masterful world building and that characters have more depth than they are showing. And now I have so much trust in the storyteller and I can feel that the ending must be good. Um, I'm not sure how to call it. Story Ascension? My question is, did either of you ever experience anything similar to this in any media? Best regards, Deadly Dark. So... You know, I sat here and thought about this one for a while, and it makes sense. I was like, oh, sure, that's happened to me, uh, uh, and I cannot think of a single example. So, um, Paul, has this ever happened to you? I feel like it, it must have happened at some point. Um, I feel like what happens, though, is that the, the stories where this, where, uh, what? The stories that are well told have a reputation for being well told and so it's not like you enter into them with the idea that they're going to be bad uh oh, it yeah. seems like this happened to deadly dark only because he didn't know if this series was good or not and so he just assumed that it was going to be bad like all the other anime right right so for this to happen you have to go in willingly to watch something that you believe ahead of time is going to be bad which isn't something we you do very often yeah. Well, and it has to also, it, well, I mean, I assume if your taste is decent, that it has to also actually be good. And so you have to right. not have heard about it from anyone else. So like, if you were going to sit down and like read Shakespeare or something, and you're like, I don't know who this guy is, but you know, here's, I'm, I've got a couple hours to kill. I should read Macbeth. And then you're like, whoa, this is actually really good. And like, oh, wow, this is fantastic. <laughs> there's all this character development. Like what, what's going on with this guy? Who's, who is this guy? Right? Like, you could imagine that, like someone coming in blind and being like, oh, this is incredible, like, you know, but, but like, if something's really good, usually people will be telling people about it, like, hey, this is a really good thing, like, right. you, should, you should do it too, you should read it in school, in high school, right? And like, okay, well, now everyone knows Shakespeare, and so they're not going to go into it and being like, all right, who is this no-name guy? So... I feel like the opportunities for this happening are not as many as the opportunities the other way around. Because if you go into a story that's right. new, uh, then it could be good or bad. And you're going to usually give the benefit of the doubt because you went into it hoping that it was good, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have spent time on it. Right. I suppose you could think of examples where a story is better than you expected. Like, for me, it's the Saints Row games, where I thought... I wasn't expecting a good story, and then it turns out, oh, these are actually these are actually well-written little vignettes about these characters. But I don't know if you would call that story coalescence. I, I mean, it, I guess it does sort of. I did come to trust the writer, where I expected it to be stupid, and then it it got to be good. So I guess I've sure. experienced it. That's a good example. The one that left to my mind isn't about a game, but it's a TV series. And I don't watch TV series hardly ever. But uh, someone was saying, like, Ages of S.H.I.E.L.D. is pretty good. And, like, if you've got some time, you should watch it. And I just happened to have access to whatever it was, Netflix or whatever that it was on. And uh, so I was like, all right, well, I've got some time. I'm going to take a look at this. It's probably going to be garbage. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised. I was like, wow, this is... This is actually pretty neat and so watching through the series eventually i got it like all right i'm gonna see this through the end and uh convinced that the ending would be good because it was had been so well presented throughout the whole thing and it kind of felt like it was all coming together and you know building to this neat climax um it has kind of a sad ending because the ending wasn't 
actually particularly impressive to me and they left a bunch of oh. threads hanging and it was just like ah uh, well it didn't turn out as well as i'd hoped but i was still pleasantly surprised by by the quality of it overall all right you want to read this next one you go for it no intro so i'll just read it here we go dear diecast we got two uh inquiries about this same article so i'm going to just kind of read the summary dear diecast i came across this article i thought it'd be interesting to talk about it's about drm Apparently, the EU did a study on piracy on sales of games, music, movies, and found that there was no impact, and sometimes piracy actually helped games, except when it was a recently released blockbuster movie. What are your thoughts? Jennifer Snow and Nico. Thank you both for pointing this out, because this is fascinating and really supports a lot of things that Seamus has written about over the years. Right. It supports what I think so much that I'm skeptical of it. <laughs> You're so convinced. Uh, well, no, I don't want to jump on it. And okay, put it this way: if one of the if one of the companies, let's say Ubisoft, came out and they say, "Oh, we've got numbers that prove that our DRM is is effective," I would be extremely um, suspicious of those numbers, right? I and I kind of feel that here, like. I immediately want to question, all right, well, how did you study this? What was your methodology? Oh, interesting. Even though the, the results support your point of view. Right. It would be easy for me to just swallow this whole. And so that makes me want to, you know, be even more careful. I don't want to jump on it and find out it's just, there's nothing to it. Um, mm. It makes sense. It intuitively supports what I, it, it supports what I've intuited about piracy all these years. But again, you know, what was the methodology? And is this study something I could use to convince other people? Or are the people, like, would somebody at Ubisoft look at this and go, oh, yeah, but they don't know what they're talking about. We've got this other, you know, is this useful or is this just preaching to the choir? Mm, yeah. Um, I want to believe it, though. Yeah, it's it yeah, it makes a lot of sense and it was interesting to see that they were uh apparently this came to light pretty recently because this is what is this 5 years ago now? 4 4 years ago. And uh if they've been if the EU was trying to suppress the existence of this thing then it seems like it points it, it's at least convincing enough that they thought that it would be damaging. Right. I wonder if anybody at Ubisoft took even the slightest notice of it or if they found it at all persuasive. Because it really doesn't even matter what the truth is. It matters what, like, Bob Ubisoft thinks is the truth. And as long as he thinks that DRM is good for him, he's going to be shoving you play down our throats. And one yeah. of the frustrating thing is we've already had that, that problem where they obviously do not hear our side of the conversation. You know, we ask all these questions. Hey, how about this? Oh, you know, you say it to protect sales during the, you know, it protects during the early sales period. Great. After that sales period, can, can you remove it? And all you ever get out of them is boilerplate. You know, oh, we believe in our products and this is, you know, we need to do this to protect ourselves in the new frontier and blah, 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 blah. It's obvious they do right, not hear right. anything we say. So the fact that we've got this study now, we can hit them over the head with, that'll just be another thing that they don't hear. Yeah, another thing that they can ignore. Right. What about this study? Oh, we're really committed to DRM. We believe it helps us. Yeah. <laughs> but this but this study proves that it's not good. And we have just a huge believer in DRM. Like, it doesn't matter. You're talking to a wall. Right, right. Um, we're committed to our stockholders' position in the market and maintaining the quality of our product across the global share of marketplace. Exactly. Exactly. And you're like, oh, is this a recording? Man. Is this thing on? Is this real? Right. Where am I? What, what have you done to me? Greetings, dear Diecast. I was thinking about which games I am really fond of and noticed that between Tomba, made by Whoopi Camp, Revenant, made by Cinematics, 
Arcanum, made by Troika. Hey, finally I'm one I've heard of. I have quite a few that are made by studios that died before their time. Are there particular game studios that you like that went too soon? I know 13 Window likes Looking Glass, but what about Uber Detlef? Vale Tim. Okay, what is Ober Detlef? That's going to oh, be Oh, yeah, Ober Detlef. That's, uh, yeah, that's my um, engineer persona. I've got a, a little miniseries on YouTube that air Ober Detlef's House of Inventions. Ah, <gasps> uh, it does. It sounds very German. That Ober may, mm. look, makes me think of Uber. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's supposed to be. It's a German. I don't know. For whatever reason, when I'm doing engineering and I really want to get into like the engineering mindset, it goes to German for whatever reason. I mean, if we're trading in crass stereotypes, then yeah, Germans are the are the great engineers. <laughs> so what do you think? Studios that went before their time. All right. Here's the thing. Like, there are a lot of studios that are gone, but they're still in business, right? Like, they. The more common thing for a studio is not that it closes. Closing studios is actually pretty rare. Um, studios that become something else is very common. Mm, yeah. Um, like yeah. Bioware. Bioware. Blizzard. The old Blizzard was just a just a factory of legendary um, game ideas. I mean, like. The late 90s and early Blizzard of the late 90s and early aughts did nothing but put out games that sort of shaped the entire industry. Yeah. Um, I mean, they just, and they, not that many people either. And every time they put out a game, it shook the entire industry. That's how powerful they were. And obviously, they do not have that kind of oomph these days but they didn't go under they just all of their creative people left and now it's just a name but mm, yeah to answer to answer the question um there are a few black isle which is just troika before troika like black isle went out of business and then they became troika or did they go out of business or did they rename themselves and then go out of business I forget now. Anyway, Black Isle. LucasArts, which did they go under or did they just sort of like lose interest in games? Because like Lucasfilm didn't go anywhere. They they fizzled out and then I think they were closed by Disney only a few years ago. But they had stopped being contributory to the gaming scene for years before that. Right, but LucasArts just... Right, but there was this golden age of LucasArts games, which are phenomenal. And it's like, did they not make money? Or what was, the, why did that, why did LucasArts not become just this huge studio? It kind of made these amazing games and then faded away anyway, and I couldn't figure that out. Mm, yeah. Was it not making money? Like, maybe their games were so good because they were spending so much on them. Or maybe they well, were making money. What they hired... You know, uh... Wouldn't they hire uh, that big film director guy for The Dig? Was it um, Spielberg? Oh, I didn't have know. You played about The this. Dig? I've not played The Dig. Oh man, yeah. I think it was Spielberg. I, I'm not going to look it up right now, but anyway, yeah. Lucas Arts was incredible back in the day. And then uh, another one that I guess did finally go under that really shouldn't have was Maxis. I don't know if they went mm. before their time. I think they stopped being Maxis and then they went under. So it's hard to make the case that it died before its time. And like, you know, The Sims is still going. So really it's just right. like the but the old Maxis, the Maxis that put out weird sim games. Hey, let's simulate an ant colony. Yes. What who comes up with idea who, who comes up with an idea like that? Well, Will Wright apparently. Like that Maxis sort of died, then was bought by EA and continued to make a few tentpole games, and then those games sort of lost their way, and then the studio was Was closed. it Spore? Was that the turning point? You know, that might have been it. It might have been Spore. Because I think they the... started making Spore, and then they ran out of money, and then they sold themselves to EA so they could finish Spore. I, I could be completely wrong on this, but... Right. 
Right, but th that's uh, that fits with the timeline that I have in my head of like before Spore, um, Maxis was indie was an independent, not like indie, like little, like ten people. I mean, independent, like not owned by a pub publisher. And after Spore, they were owned by EA. So somewhere in there was that transition, that phase change. Yeah. And Spore was such, there were such high hopes because Maxis was such a, a darling of of the public and everybody loved their games. And, and like Spore is going to be this incredible, perfect experience, right? And then it just wasn't. Right. And it didn't feel like a Maxis game. Yeah. In gameplay terms, it just, it felt like it was missing something. Yeah, it almost felt like a PopCap Studio game where it was just too yeah. shallow and too quick and too flashy. And Right, it was very concerned with being cute and not concerned with being... Although, that's another one I'd put that died too soon is PopCap. I mean, yeah. you know, we're, we're criticizing them now, but Pop, if you're looking for that kind of game, nobody else could do that kind of game like PopCap. Right, well, and there's no problem with PopCap games. It's just that right they aren't maxis right like they're different and it felt like they were trying to be something that they weren't they're were putting on airs if it were right and like the original plants versus zombies is a friggin game design a masterwork of game design mm, yeah and uh now that is not true i don't know if popcap is closed but like popcap as it was back in the aughts no longer exists yeah, if I remember correctly, they got eaten by King, which are the guys who made Candy Crush. Oh, I know their properties are owned by EA now because they turned um, Plants vs. Zombies into a shooter. And that sounds like a joke, but it's not. <laughs> no. Like, that's no. literally true. Like, if you wanted to, like, if I was trying to, like, make fun of EA and I didn't know, that would be the joke I came up with. Okay, we're gonna buy Plants vs. Zombies and turn it into a shooter. Like, just the stupidest, like, drooling, imbecile, <laughs> you know, corporate executive that doesn't understand video games at all and has never been in the uh -huh. room with a video game. Turn Plants vs. Zombies into a shooter. But then they actually did that. And it's like, well, you guys are beyond parody. I, 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 and, you and it was actually good. No, no, it wasn't good. So, um, what about you, Paul? Who died before the well, time? I mean, pre pre WoW Blizzard, I think is is my top pick because it really feels like it's a different company. It feels like a different studio after after WoW just took off. And I think right. maybe what happened was that WoW was such a success that they weren't any under any pressure anymore. Like financially, they didn't have to do anything anymore, and so they just kind of right. fell to pieces and went to seed. But I, yeah, I don't know what happened there. But that's very, it's a very sad loss. The the blizzard of yesteryear. Um, Runic Games, I, I, they didn't produce very many games, but the ones they made were just didn't really they? charming. I, when you say Runic Games, I have this picture of a real time strategy game that was um, it was really bloody. Am I thinking of the right company? I back in, I back don't in the heyday know like that one, Starcraft. But okay. I don't think so. They made Torchlight. Oh no! Okay, then I'm thinking of somebody else. Who was the one that made that really bloody real-time strategy game that was like contemporary with the original Starcraft? I can't remember. Like Command and Conquer, or no, no, not Command and Conquer. <sighs> It's right on the tip well, of my tongue, but I can't think of it. Post in the comments, everybody, when you think of Seamus' game for him. Anyway, Runic Games, they made Torchlight, they made uh, Hob, I think was the last game they made, and then they went under, and it was just it's so sad, because like, the games they made were very kind of different, and, uh, and I, I love the stuff they make. Um, Gas-powered games, also. I loved the, um, the Dungeon Siege, and especially when they started getting into... They never actually made it procedural, but like they had all the tools to make procedural dungeons, and then they just kind of like died on the vine, and so that was a that was a sad loss too. Oh, I thought I I thought I remembered that game, and I was sure it was from Mythic Entertainment, and I looked up Mythic, and no, 
That doesn't have the game I'm thinking of either. This is going to drive me crazy for the rest of the show. What is that RTS? My goodness. Ah. All right. Well, we got to keep going. Whose turn is it? I think it's mine. Dear Diecast, so you were talking about the crazy ideas and experimenting going on in the late 90s and early aughts last week. Molyneux did something in black and white that I haven't personally encountered anywhere else. To cut down on the UI clutter, he used a mouse gesture recognition to trigger spell casting. And I remember it as basically tracing a pattern on the ground, like a spiral for fireball, a few times for practice, and then it was up to you to make it work going forward. Has this idea cropped up anywhere else? Most commentary in the game barely acknowledges it, so I'm left wondering, was it received positively or negatively or just swept away in the passage of time? Are there any other strange mechanics you've encountered over the years that you wish had stuck around or alternatively overstayed their welcome? Thanks, Will. Thank you for the question, Will. That is, yeah, I remember that uh, in in black and white. The, the main thing that annoyed me about it was that I had to, like, come up with a thing and then remember what it was. And, like, you start accumulating spells and you don't use one for a while. And it's like, oh, no, how do I do that thing? Like, what it, do I have to make notes? Right. Um, I remember gestures being all the rage there for a few, for a hot minute there in the late 90s. I remember there were a couple of games that used gesture-based spellcasting. And, um... Yeah. And I think it was just unreliable. I, I think it's actually something that, at the time, you, I thought, oh, man, it's just too hard to make these symbols reliably with the mouse. But looking back, I'm like, I'll bet you the problem wasn't that I wasn't being exact enough. I'll bet the problem is the AI trying to read those symbols. I mean, that's basically yeah. character recognition, which is an AI problem we've only recently solved in the last decade. Like, mouse gestures were were about 15 years ahead of their time. They 15 years before we had the technology to do them right. Because, you know, like if, um, let's say the gesture was the number eight, just, you know, or, you know, like an infinity symbol, right? So you've got that loop, that looping pattern. But what if you make one loop way bigger than the other? Well, you know, to a human being, that's no big deal. You'll still recognize it. But to any sort of, you know, hand-coded recognition system, it's going to really struggle to figure out what the frick you're trying to, to do there. <laughs> what are you trying to tell me? Right. It'll probably assume, oh, you made one loop much bigger than the other so it'll think that you just did the gesture that is just a circle <laughs> right you're just trying to draw a circle you made a little accident there on the side of it right exactly and yeah it's character recognition which is really really hard and so i think that's why that died is because it was too unreliable and because it was it's something that seems trivial for the user when it fails to recognize that i did a letter s and i feel like i did a pretty good s and it you know guesses that i made a circle instead it feels <laughs> like all oh, they, they right it feels like oh they programmed this badly because it's like something that a child can do so why is why is this game struggling to do it? But of course it's a, it's this is a you know a machine learning problem. This is a really hard problem that we've only solved recently. So and even the, you know we solved it 15 years ago, but you know that wasn't a form that you could package in a game. Having a solution that you could put in a game is probably very recent. Well, there are other drawbacks. To mouse gestures specifically, it, it takes a lot longer than a key press, so it's right. unwieldy. Even in that, even if it was perfect, right, it still takes you the time to draw the thing. And if you're trying to do cross-platform with consoles, then it's going to take way longer to draw with a thumbstick. And so Ooh, that's no yeah. good. And it's uncomfortable to draw with the mouse like that anyway. So it doesn't feel, after all these sacrifices, it doesn't even feel good. Yeah. You were joking about uh, the piano having too many keys, but that really is a problem with inputs, right? Like if you have too many inputs, too many possible inputs, then you're stuck with this like, well, what am I going to do with all these things? And that's exactly what you have with gestures, right? There's a nearly infinite number of gestures you could make and like that, right. the space is way larger than the number of things you actually need to do with the game. 
So I think people looked at gestures and they're like, this is nice, but what if we just had a pie menu and then just everyone used right. pie menus? Right. That's easier to code and people will be able to make a clear choice. You know, I will select the thing I definitely want from the menu and it will happen as opposed to yeah. hey I feel like I drew this dick butt properly but it thinks I drew a figure eight this thing <laughs> or a flower or something right yeah and it's great for consoles because you can do it as easily with a mouse as with a thumbstick so um, speaking of mechanics that have fallen by the wayside I miss adventure game text parsers I know that's crazy. I realize why they died. Like, that's a PC only thing. You, you're not going to be typing on a console. Mm. And um, not everybody wanted to type, and not everybody liked trying to. Like, a lot of people would try and, and type grammatically correct things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that was always a disaster. Like, uh, pick because up English. the sword. Right. Pick up the sword and it would be like, you know, it, it thinks you want something named up. There's no object called up here <laughs> or something equally nonsensical. Yeah. So while I understand why text parsers died, I miss them because there are some things you can only do with a text parser. Um, the six degrees of freedom of descent, like that was always a niche thing. A lot of people just did not get into that. I loved it. I mm. miss it. And I uh, I miss Red Faction's destructible environments. And I always kind of miss... I, I guess Battlefield does it, but I don't play Battlefield. Because it's an online shooter and, like, yuck. Um, but, you know, games that with really destructible... Honest, not just, like, you can blow up cars. But, like, really being able to tear down the neighborhood. I just... Mm. That's just such a cool. I thing always to be felt able to that their uh, their terrain de destruction was kind of missing because they had all this building destruction, but then it's like, but the driveway is indestructible. Right. right. Yeah, and it's it's odd. I mean, there, there's this whole sort of branch that video games could have explored, and if there had been one really big hit game, like if Grand Theft Auto had fe had featured destructible buildings or destructible terrain or something then everybody would have copied it and we'd be living in this world where destructible geometry was just you know a pretty common mechanic but it never really like landed. minecraft was just like a hit right instead of being the tiny indie darling that it's always been <laughs> i think minecraft is a special case though people don't like look at minecraft and go we should put one meter cubes into our you know open world shooter or whatever yeah <laughs> but like you know meter. valheim has destructible buildings and destructible terrain and i think there are a lot of games now uh what is it fortnite had destructible buildings and stuff before it turned into that's true whatever fortnite is now a storefront <laughs> platform yeah so those are some of the things i miss uh th for mechanics that overstayed their welcome which was an alternate question will post hot bar combat my goodness, hot bar combat stayed way longer than it needed to. It sort of became an industry standard and then everybody left it. And the, the latest batch of MMOs have been moving away from it and doing a pretty good job mm. of moving away from it. I remember um, it was a Korean MMO, Black Desert Online. Mm. Really felt like a, it felt like an action game. You know, you could play it with a controller. Felt pretty good. Um and and that was nice that was nice but hot bar combat i think it was originally designed for dial up and yet it persisted so far into the world of broadband <laughs> without getting replaced and i thought that was really strange i would have yeah, liked it well, better wow was doing it so it must be perfect exactly wow was successful and wow had hot bar combat therefore hot bar combat is good and wow was drm so i mean like DRM's good, too. Right. So what about you, Paul? Uh, mechanics that stick around too long. Uh, the right kick select in Blender, I think, was... It was never... It was faded to, to go by the wayside. It finally has. Finally right. has. Uh, there was... A, the, um, the gesture stuff reminded me of the song system in Aquaria. I don't know if you, you played Aquaria, but it was like a... Uh, 
2D side scrolling platformer, but you could swim, so it was actually more like a fly a flying game or something. Um, but it was very pretty and it had this thing where you had to like cast spells by singing a song. But it was basically just a pie menu, so I don't know if it if it was the same. It was like a you know combination lock with a pie menu, more or less. Interesting. I thought that would have been neat trouble. to have more things like that. But but again, it takes time to input, and it's a little way easier to press one button than to press this whole series in combination, so I don't know. Right. Destructible Terrain is pretty cool. I, I, I would like to see more than that, although, uh, like I said earlier, it seems like it's showing up in more games these days, and so it, it may still be, you know, like, um, what, Breakdown? Break, uh, teardown. Teardown's all destructible. Yeah. Teardown, you know, it re the trailer makes a big deal about Teardown's destructible environment. But for me, the real selling point is the ability to burn everything more than smash it. <laughs> and I am just, I'm a firebug. I'm a pyromaniac in that game. I am just like looking for a way to burn down every building. There was a... There's this one map, it's all trees and wooden buildings, and I couldn't find anything to start a fire with. Like, I was so oh, no. frustrated. I wouldn't. Now, this was months ago. I'm, you know, it's, I'm sure it's been updated since then. But I couldn't figure out how to get it started. Or I could make a spark and it would, like, burn a little bit. Oh, yeah, that's right. Trees wouldn't, like, really go up. Trees would smolder a bit and then sort of fizzle. Uh -huh. And and that made me disappointed, and I wanted I wanted to burn everything down, and I believe the game can support it. Like if you go around and just spark every single tree manually, you can get the whole place burning, and your computer will handle it fine. It's just the fire spreading mechanic is too conservative. Mm -hmm. All right, dear diecast. Recently, I was looking through my console game collection and reminiscing about the worlds I experienced. So I was wondering, what are some unique and memorable settings you have enjoyed? Veil vale Tim. Uh, for me, the big, big one is Mist. The Mist series, I've always really dug. It's sort of like this, this group of people that create worlds by writing books. And it feels like it's adapted from a novel. Like, it feels like this was an idea that was a novel somewhere. And uh, we're just seeing a right. little part of it. It's the kind of idea that an author would come up with. Oh, what if authors right. were the, the linchpin of creation? Right, exactly. And the, also the depth of it and the amount of backstory. They hinted an awful lot and say very little. And so it always feels like this is an adaptation from a larger war. You know, like, imagine sort of a simple video game based in the Dune universe. And you realize, oh, there's all these tons of lore just beyond these menus <laughs> that you can't really get to from within the game. But you're, you know, you can feel it's there. That's what Mist always felt like to me. Mm, yeah. Uh, Thief, I always really enjoyed. It's, I thought, the setup of the city. I'm actually kind of disappointed that the city in Thief is called the city. Um, cities have names. I don't think historically we've ever had a city that was called the city. Cities have names. Um, but I did think its design in that it's balanced between the, um, the Hammerites, which represents, you know, modern order and mechanization and the... Um, the hippies? What what is the hippies called? The tree huggers. That represent yeah. they they worship the trickster and they represent nature and chaos. And I always thought that was just that's a great concept right there. Neither one is good or evil. They are just different aspects of the world around you, and you kind of need both. And they're mm. inherently in conflict with one another. And you sort of exist between them. I thought that was just a masterwork of world design. Um, and I also really appreciate the world building in Prey 2017. Like, I love thinking about the Typhon um, creatures. I think they're really interesting. They're some of my v favorite video game spooks. I feel like there's so many answers to this question, though. Because right. like every 
every game has a setting and any good game is going to have a setting that plays to the strengths of its of its medium and its its uh, mechanics and stuff like I love thinking about the world of Super Mario Brothers and like you know like the chocolate hills like are they actually made of chocolate or like is it is it just a place where they make chocolate or or like it looks like the vanilla dome is actually like a giant ice cream thing and there, are those crystals sparkling in the background like ice crystals or what's going on with this world and like you know so many of these things are hinted at and it allows you the freedom to explore in your imagination what does it really mean you know and what am i actually doing in this game huh i never thought about mario brothers that much i think probably the the one uh that leaps first to mind is the longest journey just because it's so close to our world but also like this fantastical diversion in so many ways that is a world uh, now i soured on the longest journey series um in the sequel in dreamfall but yes that original game it was another it was another one that feels like it's adapted from a novel. It feels like you're just seeing this tiny slice of a much bigger set of ideas. Yeah. If we can finish this email, we will have cleared the email bag. Go for it. Dear Diecast, have you ever encountered a mechanic in a game that made you think, if I made a game, that's how I'd do it? For example, when I first played Grandia 2, I was impressed by the battle system as a global ATB where you can see how far along all the characters and enemies are and where attacks can delay their target or even knock them out of their charge up to an attack. And on top of that, positioning is worth keeping in mind as different attacks can have different attack radii. If I were to make a game, that's how I'd implement the battle system. Looking forward to hear your thoughts. Vail, Tim. Thank you, Tim, once uh, more. Um, yeah, for me, there, there, there are a million answers to this question, but I limited myself to two. Uh, for me, oh, I mentioned Descent earlier. I always felt like Descent needed something, some sort of gameplay between missions, like upgrade your ships, some sort of shop, some sort of sell loot, buy upgrades, you know, the, the, maybe not turn it into a full RPG, but something for you to customize your ship since it was such a big part of the game. Now that yeah. isn't necessary. Yeah, that isn't necessary. I mean, Doom didn't have that. The Doom did guy didn't like go shopping between levels. But I just felt like in Descent, it would have been really appropriate. Um, yeah. And I always wanted to see that. Uh, and one of the things I've always, always wanted, this goes all the way back to 1993, is for immersive sims to have randomized loot and foes. My goodness, those games need that so very bad. Because it is just so easy to memorize. Okay, I'm just going to go down to level two, pick up the best weapon in the game behind this hidden door, and then go down to level three and get the best armor in the game. And then, and then I'll clear out the rest of these levels, you know, being overpowered. And you can choose not to do that. But then you're deliberately choosing to like, well, then why don't, why do I pick up any weapon? <laughs> like, I know it's yeah. there. Yeah. You want to kind of be able to have it like a, like a dungeon crawl, like Lindley's dungeon crawl or something where you've got the chance to explore and not knowing what it is you're going to find and, and not knowing even what kind of things you might discover. Right. Right. Like really like even the knowledge that there needs to be a shotgun somewhere on level two, I would even challenge that as an assumption. Like, I don't want to know that. I don't want to know, hey, I need to keep looking. I've passed up the shotgun. I don't want to go to level three until I've found the shotgun that I know I'm entitled to. I would just love if it was based on loot tables and maybe this game I'll get a shotgun on level one or maybe I won't get it until level five or maybe they're just... You know, the dice will hate me this time and I won't get a shotgun. I think that would be really interesting and would make these games much more replayable. These games, I love them very much, but they they have replayability issues due to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, again, it's same as Seamus. There are so many answers to this question because there are so many just like great examples of good implementations of all kinds of mechanics in so many different games. 
and like every every good game out there has something about it that's like oh yeah i would take that for my ultimate fantasy perfect right. game right but uh if i had to choose just one i think i would choose the battle system in frozen synapse where it's a synchronous turn based um plan ahead but you can also like plan your enemies moves ahead to see how it'll turn out if they do a variety of different things and so you get to like simulate the whole thing before you take your turn and the enemy gets to do that as well and then you see what plan they chose and what plan you chose it's just it's so good i love i love the battle system in frozen synapse my memory of that is the very first total biscuit video i ever saw was him just going i love this game over and over again as he played frozen synapse and explored the mechanics and just <laughs> he was just like it had obviously just connected with him on this profound level and he was just so happy and talking about how much he loved this particular kind of that particular type of um turn-based combat and i knew it wasn't new with frozen synapse that had been around since like combat mission in like the late 90s or something i mean that had been a that play 30 seconds at a time like 30 seconds of real-time action happens and then you plan 30 seconds of moves and then you hit play and all of it plays out and you see what actually happens and you see all your plans go up in smoke right um it had been around for years, but I guess Frozen Synapse really, really, I think, hooked into, like, the ideal form of that. I didn't play that far into Frozen Synapse, but it it seemed to, it seemed to reach much further than its predecessors had with that particular idea. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the history of the mechanic. I... I'm sure it wasn't the first one to do it, but it's the first one that I knew of. So it was novel to me as well as being well implemented. And I don't know if they did the uh, the enemy planning in the previous games either, or like previous games that use that mechanic. But I really like the idea of being able to communicate to the game engine the things that you think your enemy is going to do so that you can plan around them and have the engines help in planning things. Right. Instead of just okay. having to do all the calculation yourself. Right. I think he's going to send a guy up here. What? Let me see what would happen if there was a guy standing right there. Oh, wow. He would mow down half my squad. Okay. Well, now I know not to explore that, that possibility space. Okay. Right. That is just a no. That hallway is a no-go. You know, he might not decide to put a guy there when when you actually do it for real. But, you know, you can't take any chances. That's just, it's, it's just a kill zone for your guys. So you need to like work around it and you can, the simulation can help you figure stuff like that out. Even if it can't tell you what the, the enemy is really going to do. It can show you, it can let you play around hypotheticals. And yeah, that is really clever. I really wish there was a way to like have espionage where you can see what kind of moves the enemy is thinking that you might make. Like, so you can take those as suggestions. Oh, wow. So you just go another level deeper. Right, or be like, oh yeah, that is a good idea. I should totally do that. And then you could jump into its dream and give your... And in, incept the idea in your enemy to attack you in a particular way. <laughs> right. Well, that would... Yeah, that would be an incredible thing where if you could get into the mind of... Like, hack into the enemy's planning system or whatever and change the stats of your units in the way that it's simulating you so that you look better or worse than you actually are so that it'll change right. the way that they plan around what you're doing it's it's funny yeah wow there's a lot more you could do with this idea than has been done with it already and a lot's been done with it already that's how i do it all right well that's it we cleared the mailbag that was three weeks of of mail we just dealt with there and uh, if your question didn't make it into the show, um, go sit in your room and think about what you've done and then uh, rewrite your question in maybe a little better wording and send it in again. We'll, we'll get around to it next time. So no worry. Right. There there were a couple people that sent in this long sort of semi-article and then like, I don't have a question. I just thought this was interesting. And I'm like, <laughs> that is interesting, but 
I don't know how to cover that on the show. Like, that isn't a question. That's a topic suggestion. And I feel like you've already done a better job of it than me. So, <laughs> so I feel like you've started a rival podcast. And to my good fortune, you've decided to mail it to me rather than publish it. Yeah, that's... Uh... It always bothers me when there's like a live panel, right? And like everyone's there in the audience and they're asking for questions and, you know, there are always like two or three people who come up and they're like, here's my dissertation that I just thought of while I was sitting in the audience and I wanted to give it to you. What do you think about it? <laughs> it's like, that's not a question. That's an right. imposition. Well, thank you so much to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. So that's it. Uh, is there anything else? No, there isn't. That really is it. I can't believe Hopefully we can have we'll the whole have more questions next week and maybe we'll play some right. games and uh, we'll have something to talk about. Right. I can't believe we did all of those. I was about to say, and we'll get to the rest of these questions next week. Like that's what I was about to say. And then I realized I don't need to say that. For like once, for the first time in like six months, I haven't had to apologize for not covering all the questions. So there it is. Thanks for the great questions, everybody. We will see you next week. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. If only there was like piano playing in the Olympics, then I would I'd have a chance. I'd have a shot. If only there was having an asthma attack in the Olympics, then I would have a shot.